Before Dan gets here, let me just give a brief introduction to him and his background. So we met when we were both in HKN, a professional electrical engineering organization, and Dan was actually one of the few graduate students who came regularly to the meetings. And he sort of just fit in very seamlessly with all the undergrads. And we definitely hung out outside of school and outside of HKN. So I got to know Dan pretty well, and I trusted him a lot with, you know, just general school and career advice. And then I stayed at UT for graduate school, so we still saw each other around quite a bit. And when I was searching for my first full-time job out of school, I went to Dan with offers I got and asked for his professional opinion on how to negotiate and how to figure out what I actually deserved and what I should ask for and just a multitude of other stuff surrounding the topic of job hunting. So that's a bit of background on how we know each other and how much I trust Dan and his advice. But to give a bit of background on Dan specifically, as I mentioned, he also got his PhD in electrical engineering at UT in the computer architecture space. He has interned at Apple, Microsoft, and Intel, just to name a few, and he is currently a full-time research engineer at Google Brain. I will link to a paper he recently published in case anyone is interested to learn more about the specific work that he does, but he's also quite a prolific question answerer on Quora. At least he was. I don't know if he does that anymore. I looked it up right before this discussion and his answers have almost 9 million views, which sounds absurd, but he really gives great answers on a variety of subjects from food to graduate programs to finances. And today I wanted to pick his brain on managing finances and growing your net worth specifically for students, graduate students, and engineers in general. So welcome, Dan. Dan? Hey, Dan. Sting. Can you see? I, I know I have a lot of questions, but we'll just see what we can get through. I'd just like to start with some basic questions on, you know, just to understand your mindset around finances and how it impacted not only your decisions in going to school, but like later when you were applying for full-time jobs and considering those kinds of offers. So when did you start thinking about the cost and potential payout of pursuing an engineering degree, whether it be a bachelor's, master's, or PhD? That's a really good question. So I think for at the bachelor's level, I probably was not thinking about that too much. I, w I just wanted to work on uh, or, or, or study the topics that interested me, which at the time was, uh, you know, like um, I spent some time, for example, custom building like my own computer or like programming in um in high school and so that was something that was really interesting for me and actually at the time this was not known to be an area that was going to pay out a lot like money was not one of the top concerns and like and actually like people at the time were very concerned about outsourcing like people thought that you know cs graduates at the time would actually not be able to find jobs because all the jobs would be outsourced to like India and China and places like that. Now, obviously that never occurred, right? So I actually was a little bit concerned about that. So instead of studying computer science, I studied computer engineering with a goal of working more on um, the hardware side of things, right? So uh, ideally being able to design computer chips uh, such as, you know, CPUs or GPUs. So when I neared graduation, um, I had a big decision about whether I wanted to to do a master's or a PhD. And like there, I think, you know, money was a little bit more of a concern, but like, again, not something that was probably top of mind. And again, at the time, you know, tech jobs were probably not paying what they uh, do right now. I think back then it was common to get like a starting job at, let's say like Intel, like a, which was, you know, a pretty good uh, uh, company would pay around, let's say 65,000 a year, something like that. So these days, uh, it's it's gone up a lot, like for all the top top uh, tech companies. But at the time, you get you know like a a bachelor's would get paid around sixty five k, and then a master's or a PhD would get around seventy five or eighty five k. And this was considered to be quite a lot. And then my dream was to hit uh, six figures or get six figure income. Like that, that 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 was that would have been really cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny that that's your dream because now like bachelors coming out of just an undergraduate program can get a six figure salary easily. Yeah. yeah. And, and it used to be a case that you had to go to like the Bay Area to get that. But now you can get that almost anywhere. Right. 
Yeah. Well, not, not like literally anywhere, but, you know, at, at all the big, you know, tech hubs, right? Like Seattle, Austin, uh, New York City, uh, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. you were you were considering between a master's and a PhD. Did you ever think of going to work and having a company fund your master's? Well, that's a good question. Did you know so that, that was an option. Yeah, I, I, I know that was an option, but I think at the time this was not considered to be like a great option because first of all, not all companies would offer this. And the companies that did offer this usually had some strings attached. So usually the biggest string attached was that you had to work at the same company for some number of years con contractually, right? After obtaining your degree, usually I think this was like two to four years, some, I forgot off the top of my head. And uh, if you were to leave the company during that time, you would have to pay back uh, the cost of your degree. So um, I thought that was probably too big of a catch for me. And uh, so for, for me, that wasn't something that uh, I considered strongly. The, so, so the reason why I want either a master's or a PhD is because I was at the time very interested in jobs in uh, computer architecture. And to become a computer architect, it's almost required to have a, at least a master's, if not a PhD. Most people, most computer architects do have a PhD. I would say about half of them. Um, and... Um, did you know that going into your undergrad program that you would probably have to pursue a graduate degree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the funny thing is, I guess both of my parents have PhDs. So I always thought it was normal to have a PhD. Yeah. Even though obviously in reality, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's pretty unusual. But yeah, to me, like growing up, it was, it was, it was always kind of expected that I would get, a, that I would at least consider a PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think there was any um, pressure, both from myself or from my parents on, you know, oh, it's like, hey, you have to get a PhD or something like that. But um, I, I, I think for me, what really convinced me was the fact that for me, I, I think a PhD was not, like you don't have to have a strong, like <laughs> this might sound kind of bad, but in some sense, you don't have to have a super strong commitment to do a PhD when you join because you can actually leave at any time you want. And, you, and then at the end of the day, you get a free master's, right? So normally you have to pay money to, get a master's degree, right? And usually it's pretty expensive, right? And if you have a scholarship, then maybe the cost of getting a master's would go down to zero, right? But a PhD is even better than that because you, you not only get the free tuition, but you get a stipend on top of that. Uh, not a big stipend, but something like 20 to 30K a year. Yeah. And so, so for me, it was like, uh, you know, worst case scenario, if I, you know, I'll, I'll try the PhD. Worst case scenario, if I don't like it, if, you know, I find a better opportunity uh, and want to leave, I can just leave and get a free ma master's degree. I think actually we have very similar like mindsets around and sort of like similar reasonings for why we went for our PhD. But while you were going through it, did I, I know you spent a good like, what is it, eight years there? Eight, eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. But like, did you ever once consider leaving during that time? I, I mean, I would say like I, I, I've thought about it, but I never considered it seriously. It made me just think about it, but but then I, I think I was enjoying my PhD too much uh, to leave. And also, I think I think um, at some point, even though it's you know uh, logically incorrect, I th I think I also fell uh, maybe a little victim to the sunk cost fallacy, which uh, says that you know like because I've spent already you know so much time on my PhD, I might as well finish it. And also like also I, I don't want to be like a quitter, right? <laughs> it's like. <laughs> which, which is not the right mindset because you, di you didn't fail if you just leave your PhD in some sense, right? It, it's not because you still get the master's, you can still have a successful career. But I think um, logically, I, just, I, I didn't really you know, consider that. Yeah, That's funny because you did go into the PhD program knowing that you had the option of quitting. Exactly. And then when you're there, you just don't want to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's right. Yeah. So it was kind of faulty logic on my part. But I think if at some point, like if I truly did not enjoy my PhD, like if, if I truly did not like uh, in, enjoy the experience, I think I would have, you know, or, or if I was unhappy or, or depressed, I think I probably would have left. But uh, thankfully, I never uh, reached that step. Okay. Okay. So I did have one question. I think it relates a little bit to what you said. So you said you enjoyed your PhD. Did you ever at any point feel like you were cheap labor or um, anything around that? Because I feel like that's a common perception. Yeah. You know, I, I, th I think, you know, that argument has some merit. 
Um, cause you could argue that, you know, um, like postdocs do the same work and get paid twice as much. And obviously if we do, were to do this work in industry, we get paid, you know, uh, e even more, I, I guess to me, uh, I, I don't think I really considered it that way because for me, like, um, I, I was also getting something out of it in some sense. Right now, that doesn't mean that just because you're getting something out of it, it doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't get paid for like that. That's for example, when the. Uh, major arguments against uh, unpaid internships. Uh, so they, they they do pay us. It's it's not um free labor, but I guess it is you know in some sense very cheap labor. But on, on the other hand, they're not really profiting very much from from our labor as well, right? It's not like uh, you know Facebook or Google where I think they're making um, you know hundreds of dollars, hundreds of thousands in revenue per employee. I think Facebook is at like seven hundred thousand dollars per employee on average in terms of revenue something like that wow that's a good way to think about it yeah and, and i don't i don't think our, our, our professors are, are making this right so uh from a from a revenue perspective i think we're fairly revenue neutral from a uh, so 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 i i can see where the you know the, the i can see the point of the argument but I, I would say like for me that that wasn't something i thought about very much i think if, if you look at like the the quality and, and uh, production of work that comes out. If you look at purely from the uh, the throughput of the work, right? I think that it's uh, at least equal to that of a entry level engineer who gets paid a lot more. But I guess in terms of the value that the and the, the monetary value that the professor or the university gets out of it, I think it's uh, not very much, right? It's just the funding which and grant money which is used to just go put back into the program and, and uh, I guess, uh, hire more grad students. Well, I think that's a good segue into the next set of questions I wanted to ask, which are about full-time job offers. So you've interned at quite a few places and well, actually, before we get into full-time job offers, you did touch on internships with an internship job offer. Should you negotiate your salary or do you think that's is it looked down upon? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think um, different companies have different policies on intern negotiation. So for full-time jobs, uh, you can negotiate almost any offer anywhere. And if they tell you that uh, it's not negotiable, they're usually lying. For internships... Has anyone ever told you your offer is non-negotiable? Yes, people have told me for my internships. Intel, for example, has told me this. And I, 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 I believe them. I think... Intern salaries are a little bit more restricted than uh, full-time offers, but that's not to say that every single company uh, prevents you from negotiating. So I was able to actually successfully uh, negotiate two offers. One was my internship with uh, Centaur Technology, which is a small uh, chip design, x86 uh, CPU design company uh, in Austin, Texas. And the other one was uh, Apple. I think with Centaur, they weren't, it was probably their first time hiring a PhD intern. So they, they weren't really familiar with the, the, the market realities uh, relative to, you know, hiring a, uh, a bachelor's intern. So that one was fairly straightforward. For Apple, I had actually rejected their internship offer the year before. And then the year after, they, they, they gave me the same offer. And this time I accepted. But they tried to give me the exact same offer, like, uh, as the year before in terms of the dollars per hour, right? So what I told them was that, you know, I have a year more experience. I went to this other company. They valued the experience from the other company. It wasn't just some random company, right? And, and one of the key reasons I was getting hired was because the manager was interested in this experience. Therefore, you know, I should be worth a little bit more than the year before. And uh, they did bump me up by, you know, some some small amount. They, they bumped me up by two dollars an hour, which, which 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 is you know not nothing, but also not a huge bump. But you know, it was worth the you know. 10 minute phone call, right? So. Yeah. And that's a very good argument too, because they do actually, like, I do know big companies, I mean, their internship salary is just already set depending on how many years experience you have. So it would make sense if you had one more year of experience that your offer would yeah. be a little bit more. Yeah. Also, I mean, I had, I worked with the exact same recruiter a year before. She already knew me. She was the one who gave me the offer last year. Like we all have the offers on paper the year before and like year after. Like you're not, you're, come on, you're not gonna come. Come on, like we have, we have this information, right? Like don't play stupid, right? <laughs> so even from the like internship or like the graduate student days when you were working with internship salaries, and then when you 
graduated and started like looking and negotiating full-time offers, you knew your worth in some sense, right? Yeah. Like, did you go to sites like PESA or, or like Levels FYI to understand that? Or was it just like being in the industry and like talking to people? How did you know your worth? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think the the, the two uh, main reasons why people in general don't negotiate is number one, they don't know like their true market value. And number two, they're scared to negotiate because they think that perhaps a company will revoke their offer or that will look bad. It will put them off on the start them off on the wrong foot, you know, something like that. So that's definitely, um, so I'm glad you brought that up. So in terms of knowing your worth, I think that's actually pretty difficult in general, right? Because companies are at a much stronger advantage, right? Where they're giving out, you know, thousands of offers. And so, and, and they've, hire, you know, professional full-time recruiters who are experienced in the art of recruiting and who have worked at other companies and uh, know what the general labor market for this particular job looks like, right? Uh, whereas, you know, for us, you know, we're on the other side where, uh, you know, we're probably like a fresh, you know, college grad or graduate school student. And, you know, for this is probably our first time negotiating, right, for many people. And so, um, it, it's a really difficult situation to be in, right? And so understand why many people are not or, or, or maybe afraid or hesitant to negotiate. I think the, the biggest way to kind of address this, not fully address this, but to help is to, um, you know, I think knowledge is really important here. Like knowledge is, for example, what you're worth, as well as, you know, the overall tactics which recruiters use and how to kind of fight against them, right? So in terms of uh, figuring out your net worth, uh, your, 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 not your net worth, your, um, your, your market worth, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a few sources for this, right? So one is, you know, talking to your friends, which I think a lot of people do already. And the other one is, you know, resources online. So levels.fyy is a great uh, site. So I think back when I negotiated, it wasn't quite as, levels.fyi didn't quite have as much data as it did um, today. And Glassdoor was the popular site back then. But the issue with Glassdoor was that uh, most of the numbers on the site seemed a little bit off. Like maybe they're not for like your specific type of position. Like for example, as a PhD student from a pretty good university going to you know this specific company. And I think usually, and I think they have changed it by now, but I think back then it only had like base salary and things like that. So it was not the full picture, right? So um, I think uh, levels.fi is a good opportunity, a good uh, option. I think talking to your friends is a really underrated option. I think a lot of people are maybe a little bit shy about talking, you know, specific numbers. I think, uh, you know, in, in, in the U.S. culture, right, it's a little bit frowned upon to talk about financials, you know, with, with your friends. But I think, I think this is slowly starting to change, right? So, you know, talk to your friends about, you know, what offers they got. And, you know, not just the base, right, but also like your bonus and uh, your, your stock grants and stock options and things like that. And, you know, have, have a discussion about have, have a discussion about like their negotiation strategy, you know, things like that. I think for, for me personally, what from um, talking with friends, you know, I realized that a lot of my uh, fellow PhD graduates, especially the ones who majored in uh, or focused on machine learning were getting these absolutely insane offers, right, from these top tech companies, like like offers which like not only made me jealous but made professors jealous when I told the professors about this. <laughs> yeah, like truly, truly extraordinary amounts, and and I think that was part of my um, eventual decision to kind of pivot to not go from your know, traditional computer architecture to you know working in uh, more like machine learning, like, uh, like, for example, right now, I work on uh, computer hardware for machine learning accelerators, right? I'll link to your paper, <laughs> the description box. And uh, my, my, my compensation is still not up to the level of some of my uh, friends, even their first offers. But you know, it's, it, I think I'm, I'm quite satisfied with, with, with it now. Yeah. So you do think about the market when you're trying, like the market and how much your salary might be if you are in different positions when you think about your career path then yeah yeah definitely so i would not consider my compensation to be like the number one uh, factor when i'm looking for a job i would definitely value 
like my day to day, you know, my uh, career growth opportunities, etc. more because I think these matter more from a long term uh, perspective. And, and quite honestly, like if you're not happy, uh, you know, at your job, right, that's 40 hours a week, right, that you're not happy, like, and you're probably not happy the rest of the time, too, because you're thinking about oh, my job sucks. So I, I think it's not it's not worth the money, right? In some sense, to me, right? I, I don't think it's the it's worth the extra, you know, twenty to fifty percent pay increase if you're not going to be happy at your job. That, 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 that's just me. With that being said, I, I like I also don't think that you know you should like you should be paid what you're worth, right? In some sense, like if if a, a company is underpaying you, then they're basically you know in some sense depriving you of your your, your true worth, and you should find a, a company that values you, right? Uh, appropriately and uh, in a capitalist society right the way we companies value employees is by paying them right so uh I, yeah I, I, so i would i would value uh, compensation highly but not the number one option i i don't know if you remember the exact number i came to you with when i got my offer for the current job that i have now but it definitely because it's a small startup it couldn't really compete with some of these larger tech companies and Instead of telling me that, like, no, this is not what you're worth in this market, you did put in perspective, like, this is from a startup. So the entire experience that you'll have, like, if you go there will be different, but it could be really good. So I, I think your professional advice was really helpful in, in that sense, because not only were you, like, able to help me think maybe more practically about, like, how I could go about negotiating, but also about like the true worth, not only in terms of money of my offer, which was very helpful. But while we're on the topic of negotiating, regardless of if it's a small company or a large company, do you have some rules of thumb that you follow? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So I think um, the number one rule of thumb is that the initial offer is not gonna be the best offer, right? So- They expect you to negotiate, right? Yeah, they, they expect you to negotiate, yeah. Like you have to remember, like um, when you like the person that you're talking to, whether it's the hiring manager or recruiter, like whoever you're negotiating with, where's the face of your negotiation, right? Like you have to remember that, you know, they're, you know, a professional who is expecting to negotiate, who has negotiated with countless people already and is paid based partly at least on their ability to perform your role, which includes negotiation, right? So they're being, they're paid negotiators, right? And not only that, but they also probably negotiate for their own offer, right? Joining this company. So they're not going to be offended if, uh, if you choose to negotiate, even if they may pretend to be so, right? And so number one rule of thumb is that your first offer, the first offer that is provided, the, the initial offer is never the highest offer. They will not give you the highest offer off the bat. Even if they say it's the highest offer, it is definitely not the highest offer that they can offer. And if they say that, you know, they can't raise it, uh, there's a big asterisk next to it is that they can't raise it based off what you've currently told them, right? And, and if you were to, you know, for example, uh, talk to a company, like let's say, say you're a fresh, you know, college grad or a grad school grad, and, and say that you, um, if you were to compare two hypothetical people, right, one who knew which company they wanted to work for, interviewed with just that company and received an offer from that company versus someone who maybe does know where they want to work for, but interviewed with, let's say, 10 different companies and received, let's say, five offers or at least more than one offer, right? The latter person is in a much, much better position in terms of negotiating their offer compared to the first person. So say, even if you know person A and B both got their dream offers, the numbers that they're going to get at the end of the day from their offer are going to be different. Because person B, the, se the second person, has a leverage. And leverage is a really important concept. So that's the other rule of thumb is always in the game of negotiation, you should always try to improve your leverage, improve your standing, right? And one of the easiest way of doing that is by having multiple offers, ideally from rival companies, right? For that this particular company cares about. So for example, you know, if, if um, I'm negotiating with Google, for example, I may want to have offers if I can, if I can get them right from, you know, Facebook, uh, you know, Apple, you know, Twitter, you know, LinkedIn, uh, Amazon, right, Microsoft, you know, these these other companies, right? Yeah. So yeah, rule of thumb number two is always try to increase your leverage, and the best way to do that is through more offers. And I guess the third one is um, 
if the recruiter accepts your counter offer right away, that was that counter offer was too low, right? <laughs> like your counter offer should be something which you think is a little bit higher than what the recruiter will comfortably accept. Because your goal is to find the limit from the recruiter, right? And the way and, and what you're, you're basically doing, it's kind of, it's kind of like, a, you know, uh, Bayesian and optimizing, so, right? You have the range of possible values, right? And you want to seek to define the upper bound, right? So the recruiter is effectively trying to find the lower bound for what you'll accept, whereas you're trying to find the upper bound of what the recruiter will accept, right? And so if you test the, and, and, and not only that, but when you give an offer and the other person, when the other person accepts, like you can't take, there's no takes backs, right? You can't take it back, right? So you should always try to set a higher offer and such that it helps you find what this upper bound is, right? Oh, oh yeah, fourth tip. Fourth tip <laughs> is that as long as you're nice about it, the recruiter will never revoke your offer, right? If you're gonna play hardball, if you say things like, "Oh, I will not accept your offer unless you raise it to you know this amount," right? Then they'll say, uh, "That's too bad. We're not gonna raise it to this amount. Goodbye," right? But if you say you know something, you can say the exact same thing a lot nicer while still leaving the door open. Like for example, you can say. You know, I, I'm considering you know, several offers and, you know, if you were to you know, increase it, your offer to this amount, right, this will really help my decision, right? Like, because, uh, you know, I'm really struggling because, you know, these are all good companies and, uh, you know, some of these other companies have offered, you know, higher compensation and, uh, you know, I like to pay off my student loans or, you know, whatever, it just makes something up, right? And yeah, at that point, right, if they, if they do raise it, that's great. If they don't, you still have the window to accept it, right? So if they do accept your first counter offer and you uh, you already know that you could have gotten more what do you do at that point like you can't just... yeah I mean, unfortunately you can't do anything <laughs> in some sense like the, that that was the result like that was the final result no takes backs right so especially if you sign the offer it's it's, it's really hard to go back at that point because uh, at, at that point you, you've kind of violated the rules of the game right in some sense like the if you try to take it back right now, there are some very rare circumstances where you could potentially try to do this, where it doesn't look too bad. For example, if you were to suddenly receive another offer from another company, which you've been waiting for. But, you know, again, if you have signed your official acceptance letter at that point, if you just verbally accept it and they ha they're still processing, it's probably still OK. But if you've already signed it, it, it's very heavily frowned upon if you then leave for that. But again, there's no real punishment, right? Like you're not going to get sued for rejecting this offer. Hypothetically, if you were to have signed an offer and you then receive another offer, which you like better for some reason, you could still reject the offer because, you know, most states are at, uh, at will employment. You can still, you know, tell them that you're not going to be joining even, and then they have no legal repercussions, but you might be put on some sort of recruiter blacklist or a company blacklist, right? Yeah. Like you might, you might burn, but, but I, at that point, it will be very hard to, for example, negotiate the, your old offer, which you've already signed. Yeah. I, I just had a thought. It might also say something about the company if they just accept your first counter offer. Like it might say something about their negotiation abilities if they just accept your first counter offer too, because they, it's like, they're not even trying to negotiate with you. They're just giving you what you want. I think it depends on the context, right? Like, like for example, if you just ask for, for example, uh, like 5% more or something like that, right? Hmm. And they're like, okay, yeah, fine, whatever. Like, like take it, right? You're, you're happy, right? But, but like, if, if you ask for something like really strong and, and they accept it, you can also be a case, in a case where like both people think they won, quote unquote, won the negotiation, right? Like, for example, like you might have some incomplete information, which leads you to believe that your initial offer is very high, but they may also have some information which makes them believe that their offer was actually quite reasonable, right? So I wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, say that, you know, uh, the company accepting the first offer is, uh, is bad at negotiation. I see. That makes sense. I know you have to leave soon, but I just wanted to end with just a couple questions about like where you are in your current position, not only like at Google, but just in life in general. So do you think you would be in a better or worse financial position right now had you not pursued a PhD? Or do you think that really set you up for being so like successful financially right now? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So um, 
so, so I guess the the main cost of a PhD is the opportunity cost, right? In which you could have, basically uh, you could have spent the same number of years in which you did a PhD, which for me was quite long in a half years. You could have spent that same amount of time in industry, you know, uh, climbing the uh, career ladder. I think it's very hard to say exactly where I would have been if I didn't do a PhD, but I think um, my intuition, and I could be just telling myself this to make myself feel better, which is that my intuition is that I don't think I'll be that much better off. I think the opportunity cost for me was not significantly high because at the time when I was graduating with a bachelor's, pay was much lower than it is today, right? And it's it could be very well be the case that, you know, I, I would accept, you know, one of those, you know, offers and then I would stay at that company for, you know, some number of years. And in which case my pay would have increased a little bit, but not like a huge amount. But like right now, because I entered the job market at a really hot time, a really exceptional time in uh, tech history, I was able to get, you know, um, some uh, pre- pretty uh, strong offers by current standards, right? Like n- not, not the best offers, but yeah, reasonably strong offers. And uh, so I think there definitely would have been some opportunity cost, but I think that, um, I, so I, I, I am definitely in a worse financial situation than I would have been, but like to me, like fi- the financial situation isn't everything, right? And also I think the Delta is not super large. Okay, that, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah, you have to think of it like really holistically and again, money isn't everything. Um, yeah, yeah. One, I mean, for some people, they might value money a lot, in which case I would recommend against you know, doing a PhD. Yeah. One investing question that I have is, so you have a really nice package. Say you have a really nice package from a really big tech company, and it includes quite a bit in like stock and yeah. perhaps options to buy stock at a cheaper or like a discounted price. Do yeah. you keep all of your investments with that company or do you diversify? That, that's a great question. And uh, that's something that I think uh, has been discussed many times with my colleagues, not just at Google, but at Microsoft, my f- first job. And um, uh, when, when my coworkers uh, had a really, uh, I guess, interesting point, which is that a- as a rule of thumb, you should diversify your income, right? But on the flip side, right, tech has done so well that, you know, uh, people have not listened to the sound financial advice and, you know, made off big, right? We made, you know, huge fortunes from it, right? So um, rather than saying that, you know, people who keep all their money in one company is doing a poor job, I would say, like, try to understand, like, um, like what, like, your, your own in, in, the, in the company and, you know, their mission and what they're doing and uh, how you see their financials, not using any, you know, insider info you're not supposed to do that that's illegal but like just based off your i guess you know personal feelings and i think um in general you should probably not have 100 percent of your net worth in a single company that's also bad i would try to set like some sort of you know simple rule of thumb or simple benchmark and say like like nothing more definitely not more than half of your net worth should be in a single company and probably it's it's better if it's less than you know one third, right, thirty three percent, right. So if you're in a, a financial situation where uh, you have some other, you know, financial holdings, whether it's real estate or index funds or you know cash, etc., such that you know your RSUs coming in are less than half or a third of your total net worth, then yeah, just keep it if you think the company's going to do well. If not, you can consider diversification, right? Or if you personally, uh, if you want to play it safer, right? I, I think, um, you know, index funds are probably the better choice for, you know, lower uh, volatility and, 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 you know, just more diversified uh, income overall. Yeah. And and, uh, I, and it's also frequently the case that people talk about real estate, right? Like buying a house is a big topic too. And um, I think I think with buying a house, you, you kind of have to think about it the same way as well, which is that, you know, um, the house is also an investment and uh in the interest of diversification the total value of the house should not be I, ideally should not comprise you know the vast majority of your net worth as well right or else literally like your entire net worth is sunk into a single house and 
if the real estate bubble ever crashes, then you're just screwed, right? So that's also something to think about. So I guess still as a rule of thumb, diversify. Even yeah, but you, you don't have to diversify by selling off all your stuff, right? You can diversify by saving more money and using the the, the money that you, you've saved to uh, d diversify, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Well, I have one last question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If you, so we, we went for our PhDs because we wanted to gain like a deeper understanding of, you know, a particular topic and presumably we enjoy the work, but there's this big, I think, movement right now called the fire movement. I don't know if you've heard of this financial independence, retire early. And a lot of people in tech, I think will probably be in a position to retire early if they wanted to, and they invested right have you thought about potentially retiring early? Is that a goal of yours to retire early or do you enjoy the work that you do enough to, to just want to continue working? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, I think for me, like, uh, I, I probably value like, like to me, like my career is pretty important and, uh, I, so far at least I enjoy the work that I do, especially now that it's, you know, more, I guess, research, uh, focused for me, what fire would represent is not necessarily like quitting and you know retiring to you know and uh, sitting on some beach you know for a long time but uh maybe uh so, so i'm getting kicked out actually yeah for me uh like because i enjoy you know the work i do for my career especially now that i'm in a research focused uh area i think uh Rather than, you know, like retiring and, you know, go, going to some beach and, you know, drinking, you know, pina coladas all day. I think what fire would be for me is maybe, yeah, I, I don't know, like, like something, you know, where I'm still working and still doing things I enjoy, but maybe with like less focus on, you know, the career grind in some sense, right? Like, and uh, that could be, you know, staying where I am or depending, you know, based on where I am or, you know, joining, you know, like some other research lab, maybe like uh, like a slower paced research lab or maybe even going to academia, although I heard academia is quite stressful as well. So, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to go back to academia, though, your current position, I guess, would be it's it tests you up well because you're in research in industry. So you're still able to publish papers and be a part of the academic community, which is great. Yeah. 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 That, that was a big reason why, uh, I guess I, I tried to get the type of role that I did is to kind of keep the, uh, the door open in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I probably do have to actually go now, but, uh, if you have more questions, happy to set up another chat. Thanks so much, Dan. I, I'm going to try to edit this video down, but you provided some really great answers. So I don't know how I'm going to edit stuff out, okay. but thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your work day to chat with me. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, yeah, glad to have and looking forward to seeing the final product. Thanks, Dan. Talk to you later. Yeah, talk to you later. Yeah. Bye. Yeah, bye. All right. So Dan had to go. He graciously took some time out of his day to chat with me. And I just wanted to thank him once again for coming on my channel and answering all of the questions that I had on finances. And I'm sure viewers watching this may have other questions on graduate school, finances, working as a full-time engineer in the tech industry, academia even. So if you do have questions that you would like answered that maybe I or Dan can answer, please leave them in the comment section below. And if I can't answer them, I will pass them off to Dan and see if he can answer them. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a completely different format than anything I've tried before. If you did enjoy these kinds of long form interviews, just let me know and I'd be happy to try to find more subjects to be interviewed. If you liked the video, please hit the like button down below. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Thanks again for watching and I will see you in the next video. Oh boy.